Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are thrilled to have more than 500 people registered for today's event. This is the first of four webinars in the technical series on the conceptual framework for addressing persistent acute malnutrition in Africa's drylands. These webinars will have simultaneous French and English interpretations. I'm your host today. I'm Greg Gottlieb from the Feinstein International Center. I'm going to go over a few logistics now, and then we'll turn it over to Helen Young, who will introduce the series. Then she will pass it to our moderator, Severio Kratley. Severio will then lead the panel discussion. We will have at least 30 minutes for questions and answers at the end. This webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours, and we will end on time. In case you are new to the Zoom platform, let me take a moment to orient you. On the bottom of the screen, you see the tools you need. Please use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen if you are having issues with the platform. Please use the quick Q&A to submit questions for the panelists or moderator. You can submit your questions at any time and we'll get to as many as we can. You can submit your question in English or French. Use the interpretation button to select English or French. Please bear in mind that audio quality may deteriorate unexpectedly and become insufficient for interpretation. Our interpreters will indicate this verbally and resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality permits. We hope that the end of the session won't be the end of the discussion with and among you. We have a few ways that you can continue to engage that I'll go over after we hear from the panel. Now I'm going to turn it over to Helen Young, Professor and Research Director at the Feinstein International Center at the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. She is the architect of the adapted framework for addressing acute malnutrition that we will discuss. Thank you, Greg. In this series, we're going to be reviewing and gathering feedback on a revised framework for the drivers of acute malnutrition that is specific to Africa's drylands. An earlier study in 2018 found that the emergency rates of acute malnutrition are often found to occur persistently over many years and even decades. From this map on the right, you can see that the areas where persistent acute malnutrition have been recognized were frequently dryland regions, stretching across the Sahel and including the Horn of Africa. The original malnutrition causality framework has served us well, clearly describing the immediate and the underlying drivers of acute malnutrition. And since the 1990s, it has become almost universally adopted. I want to say here that we are indebted to the key architects of the original framework, Urban Johnson and Bjorn Jungqvist, who sadly are no longer with us. We were lucky enough to have a lot of input from Bjorn on, on this work in recent years. And I would like to acknowledge his important contribution and support. We will miss him greatly, but his thinking and insights will continue to influence us and this work. So coming back to the framework, it is important to note that the main focus has been on the immediate and underlying causes. And this contrasts with a lack of attention to the basic, more systemic drivers of acute malnutrition. The fact that these basic drivers are often overlooked or misunderstood may partly account for the persistently high rates of malnutrition we see today, which occur despite ongoing emergency interventions or development programs. If we are to develop more effective approaches for preventing and reducing acute malnutrition in these contexts, it is critical that we develop our understanding of these basic drivers and how they work. The revised framework conceptualizes these basic drivers as three interlinked areas, environment and seasonality, systems and institutions, and livelihood systems. 
Today, we are focused on the basic drivers, starting with environment and seasonality. Webinars two and three will focus on systems and institutions and livelihood systems, vulnerability, resilience and shocks. During the final panel, next steps, how drivers of persistent malnutrition shape the response, UN representatives from the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Food Program and UNICEF will present the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting and stress the urgency of developing radically improved approaches for addressing malnutrition in Africa's drylands. Approaches that must be shaped by a new understanding of these basic, more systemic drivers of malnutrition. Through this technical series, we will share recent research, some of which challenges conventional, conventional wisdom, and we will also raise issues regarding strategies, approaches, and methodology. And after the four events, we will again revise the conceptual framework based on the series discussions and your input. Next, we plan to convene a high level round table as part of which the UN agencies will seek firm policy commitments to support a more systemic approach to addressing malnutrition in drylands. And now I'm very pleased to turn it over to Severio Kratli. He is a researcher specializing on pastoralism and the editor of Nomadic Peoples, which is the journal of the Commission on Nomadic Peoples of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Studies. Severio will introduce the topic and the panelists and lead the discussion. Over to you, Severio. Thank you, Ellen. Um, as Greg mentioned, we have an incredible discussion planned. The central theme in this panel and this series of webinars is that dryland ecosystems are highly variable in space and time. Where people mostly live of such ecosystems, their livelihoods are resilient and sustainable when they work with variability rather than against it. I will introduce the presentations by saying just a few words about this. Working with variability might sound like a not practice in, a, in an exotic environment, but it is really something that we all do in our lives. As when we try to put some money aside for buffering unexpected contingencies, or when we take an umbrella with us, if we think it might rain, or when we buy a four wheel drive, even if we live in town. All these are ways of giving ourselves additional options in order to match the variability of options we expect to encounter in the world. The variability that doesn't depend on us. For example, additional options from having a car, any car in this case, might increase our chances to take advantage of the variability in the job market by enabling us to go to faraway places not reachable by public services. People who are good at matching the variability of the world they live in, enjoy an advantage over those who are less good. And the higher the levels of variability, the more a capacity to match it can be advantageous. Some livelihood specialize in this capacity and the use of the most variable environment. In these cases, an additional advantage can also come from having relatively low competition. Risk and opportunity are often two sides of the same coin. Thus focusing on avoiding risk usually results in missing out on opportunities. In development, there is a long tradition of looking at the natural environment only focusing on risk avoidance and forgetting that whether the variability of nature means risk or opportunity depends on how we engage with it. Thus the need of understanding environment and seasonality in relation to acute malnutrition in the drylands is ultimately a need to understand the ways well-rehearsed specialized livelihood strategies in these regions engage with environmental variability and which processes affect these strategies in such a way 
has to make environment and seasonality shift from opportunity to risk in the experience of local people. Today, I am joined by the Honorable Mohamed Elmi. He is the Chief Administrative Secretary at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, as well as the former Minister of State for the Development of Northern Kenya and other arid lands. Professor Hussein Suleiman, he is a professor and director at the Center for Remote Sensing and Geographical Information System at the University of Gadarif in Sudan. Professor Elena Naumova, she is a professor and chair of the Division of Nutrition, Epidemiology and Data Science at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. And Anastasia Marshak, she's a researcher at the Feinstein International Center at Tufts University. All of these folks bring long and varied experience on dryland, seasonality, infection diseases, and nutrition. And we know many of you online also bring extensive experience. So I encourage you to participate through the chat and in the other ways that Greg will describe at the end of the panelist presentations. Honorable Mohamed Elmi, you're up first, so over to you. Hello. Afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. I, my name is, I'm going to talk briefly about why the dry lands. I think the first introduction uh, showed that dry lands form a big part of many countries. In Kenya, for example, 80% uh, of the land size is uh, dry land and 40% of the population live there. In these areas, there's a legacy of historical marginalization. They're seen as remote and again, and uh, very low infrastructure. All indicators of development are very low in, and uh, they have had a major challenge. They have many challenges like insecurity in addition to the weather variability. And now climate change co complexity has come in. So I would like them to talk why that alone shouldn't be a problem, but there is a fundamental uh, problem of poor policies. Largely, the political elites in this country are either agrarian, and even if they are of pastoral or dryland background, they try to uh, emulate the solutions of agrarian, uh, they try to bring agrarian solutions. So there's really poor understanding. And later I'll talk why it is important to make the decision makers uh, know more about the dry land and therefore ultimately uh, sort out that. And why the policy, uh, lack of that knowledge leads to poor policy and persistent poor action when this, uh, uh, what you call uh, vulnerability leads to malnutrition among others, because it, this weather variability brings, uh, what you call uh, seasonality brings a lot of other problems in addition to malnutrition. And therefore the need to fundamentally uh, try to make the, the people change uh, at the top. And I will give a bit of my experience in the next level, the next slide. So, the, the first slide, I think many of you will be familiar with, it will be operational level interventions, and I'll just give a few examples. Uh, please, uh, right at the beginning, try to make sure that uh, the, the children stay with the herd, um, because pastoralists normally will split them up if it is dry and there is a problem and take the children to settlements. That's when the malnutrition comes in quickly. And there are a number of interventions that can be done, water tracking to the rangelands, uh, having uh, temporary boreholes in the uh, drylands, and also uh, taking water for drinking closer so that the caravans do not have to go for long periods. Uh, other methods that have been used is once they come into settlements, if they have some lactating animals, uh, for the supplements to make sure that the animals, uh, the, their livestock continue to produce milk, and therefore, always children are priorities among uh, these populations. The strengthened livestock offtake, some of the things so that 
if there's buying of livestock, it puts cash in the families and therefore gives them options to buy uh, food or milk for their children. Uh, it takes also shots that really destroy the uh, rangeland of the, the rangelands. And uh, I would say food aid should be among the last resort, particularly only in areas where there is no food uh, availability in the market. That's at the operational level, and I'm sure there are many more examples I would give, but uh, in, and uh, most of the people probably would know that. I want just to then concentrate on what are the policy and institutional and uh, enabling environment that needs to be created. Uh, at one point, there has to be a national early warning of all the dry land. In Kenya now, we have had it for over 20 years. And uh, initially, it was not well linked to action. So we knew there was a problem and uh, the actions were either not on time or they were not appropriate. And we had a number of them. So therefore, we need an early warning system that is decentralized, which means at a county or a district level, people know what is happening in their area and they can act and they have the capacity to do that. It must be looked to a coordinated action and so that we don't have inappropriate actions. The other one is actually the, okay, it says my internet, sound. can everybody hear me? Supporting pastoralist mobility and domestic, both within the country and across borders. It's very important that because of the season of variability, pastors have adapted a whole uh, system of moving around and making sure they keep their animals and uh, their families okay. And therefore remove things like uh, conflicts, make sure conflicts are, are either dealt with or stopped quite quickly. Also that the international borders do not become a barrier. The other one is an integrated approach to resilience investment. I want to take a bit of time to talk about this because both at national level and international level, there is a major divide between development and long-term uh, and, and humanitarian. And until the drylands are treated in a more long-term investment approach, uh, I don't think we'll eliminate the problem of malnutrition as becoming a big problem. I will give an example, infrastructure. Uh, 200 kilometers away, food will be rotting, there will be plenty of rain, and uh, just because infrastructure is very poor. During the Nino, Wajia County was cut off from the rest of the country for six months, and therefore it led to a lot of uh, bigger problems. So infrastructure, human capital, both education, an educated mother would probably do much more, a uh, literate mother, uh, to make sure that child doesn't go uh, malnourished than an illiterate one. Illiteracy in most pastoral areas is very high. Uh, investment in uh, electricity and all the things that are fund uh, foundation to any other production system must be in place. And therefore at national level, rarely do those of us who deal with the livelihoods and it, malnutrition, uh, nutrition included, do we incorporate the ministers of uh, what you call um, infrastructure or roads. We don't include the minister of internal security because security, if it's not right, then a malnutrition will kick in because people are vulnerable, they can't move their traditional movements. And therefore, in Kenya, 2012, 2011, 2012, a number of years we have tried that. As Iga region, we came up with something we are calling ending drought emergencies, basically building resilience of communities. And until such approach is done and institutions are put in place, like we have a drought, um, drought management uh, authority in Kenya, which is a criteria to all these ministries, it's not yet working perfectly, but I do believe once you have the policy in place, you need the institutions that wake up every morning, do not only do the drought cycle, but also coordinate all the actors. And for me, that is critical. Internationally, the same. They must buy into the long-term investment so that droughts do not have to, or a season of variability do not have to lead to emergencies, including malnutrition. And therefore, I will end by saying there must be appropriate plans. 
and the strategy for the national and the, uh, the county or district levels must be one in which is uh, knowledge-based, which is on early, on early warning, it must be predictable. Families who live in that general area must know when this happens, this will happen to them, meaning there will be these following actions. You do not want people to wait until children are malnourished, until they are seen in the, the living rooms of the capitals and international community comes in. That's already too late. And therefore, we believe that, those, uh, that we need to invest early, appropriately, to build the resilience of these communities. Thank you very much. Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mohamed Elmi. And now let's hear from Professor Hussein Suleiman. Thank you, Saverio. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Not anymore. Uh, thank you, Saverio, and welcome everyone. Uh, I, I, I will start my talk by a little bit more general information about rainfall uh, because it is the most important water resource in the area. And as we know that in the dry land and especially in the Sahel, there is profounding changes in rainfall and this change is expected to continue in the future. And uh, this fluctuation in rainfall is causing very uh, important uh, consequences on the environment and the production system in the area, including reduction in food production and instability in food supplies. In Sudan, the eastern part uh, of the Sahel, uh, I will focus on it a little bit to give uh, how things are how climate is changing in the area. There is significant increase in temperatures, and at the same time. Uh, there is decline in rainfall, especially in the more drier part of the country. And uh, dry years are becoming more frequent in the last 30 years. And also, as we hear from the international news all over the world, maybe, uh, that this year we, are, we suffered from a huge uh, impact of, uh, of floods. And all these things are causing food gap and malnutrition in different ways and in different places across the country. Uh, because of that, I think, it's important to look on climate change and productivity of the life, livelihood systems and to think about uh, the interrelationship between, between, between the two, between both systems together and, all, uh, and, and should be taken into humanitarian programs. Next slide, please. Uh, like, uh, I, 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 I mentioned earlier by Saviriu, livelihood systems in dry land are working with variability and not against it. And therefore, I think it is very important to improve our understanding of the dry land ecosystem and uh, including the local knowledge and the local perception of the community living of the area because of their very long experience and adaptive capacity and how they are, uh, they, are, they are dealing with all these unexpected and variable resources in their area. And also at the same time, we, have, we should have better understanding on the barriers and challenges facing them and how we could make an intervention to solve such kind of problems. And I think two aspects that supporting the, the local livelihood system and the local community are their flexibility and adaptive capacity. They have long history of life with adaptation to close their food gap and in Sudan, if we look closely in some of the regions where, uh, where there is uh, a typical uh, climate shocks, there is shift in livestock herds, livestock species ownership, changing from cattle to sheep and, and some area to goat because it's more tolerant to drought. And also people are changing their crop variety to, add to other varieties to cope with the situation. And this has effect on their diet and their food. 
And the main strategy, I think, for most people living in the rural area, being pastoralists or agro-pastoralists, uh, that they are changing their uh, mobility, livestock mobility pattern. In the next slide, I will go in more details, and I will try to show some examples on how uh, people are trying to utilize the variable resources in the landscape. I will give examples from th across three seasons, the hot dry season and the first showers just before the rainy season and after the establishment of the rainy season and how pastoralists are trying to utilize and optimize uh, the resources in the area. Uh, the, the example I am showing is two herds owned by one person. He had he owned he's a rich guy. He owned a sheep herd and a camel herd. He try in our right hand. The example is the, is the showing the mobility across the three season as we see here in the legend how livestock are moving across the landscape. Uh, we know that, for example, he has the ability to send the, his, his camel herd away from home because the watering point during dry season could be every uh, two weeks maybe, so that he has no problem because uh, to sending their herd, uh, the, herd uh, uh, the camel herd away from home, uh, because the big issue at this time of year during dry season and maybe in Rushash is how to find to get water for your animal. Somehow you will find a fodder in the remote area, but in this remote area, you will not find suitable water resources. On the other side, in our in our in our uh, left hand, we have another another example showing how they are trying to manage the mobility of the of the of the sheep herd. He tried to keep it uh, somehow near from his home area during the when there are difficulties during dry season. Uh, somehow this is causing also some kind of a degradation of the resources and some kind of uh, land degradation, especially in the area because there is. Uh, high concentration of livestock along, along, along the, around the, the, the villages. During the rainy season, situation will totally change it so that he has the, ch the chance to send his livestock away, camel and cattle. But at the same time, he is keeping some small number of lactating animals around him. Uh, but anyhow, this lactating animal will not be like enough for the whole family. Maybe the priority will be given for children or sick people or old people, something like that. So that on one hand, we have the benefit of uh, trying to utilize the environment, using mobility as a strategy to benefit from the whole environment. But at the same time, it has consequences on the uh, access to food and nutrition from animal products and uh, to get some animal protein, something like that. And in the next slide, I will focus on in one of the specific time of the year, which is Rushash. This is the time where we have the biggest peak of malnutrition. It is something like two to three weeks, very short uh, tradi tra 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 uh, transitional season. And this is just before the first showers, uh, just before the start of the, rain, of the rainy season. During this time, the vegetation is very scattered and uh, still uh, not enough for, 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 uh, for the herds because of that. Uh, animal owners and herders, they try to compete and try to, to, to be the fairest comers in the specific area. And somehow they are not strict to man-made water resources during this time. And this time is very short, but I would like to emphasize it is very sensitive and very important time of the year where we have the peak of the malnutrition. In the next, uh, I will continue by talking a little bit more on uh, something related to climate shock. And very frequent climate shock are shaping the population and the dynamic and demographic situation of different countries. We know that from experience from the 80 drought, very famous drought during 80s in Sudan, uh, a lot of people migrated from their home area and coming to urban centers. And uh, after every wave of, of, of if after uh, following any drought event, there are waves from people coming from place to place and trying to be around big settlements and they are leaving their, their, their home area. All drought and climate shock are causing uh, uh, shift in livestock specialization, changing from nomadic to be more settled community and also from pure pastoralism to be uh, to, to become agro-pastoralists, uh, maybe because they lost their livestock and also they know that it is no longer they can practice the old practice under the current situation.
they have their very rich uh, local knowledge and they have their own perception how to interpret all these uh, interacting factors and bringing them into decision. But based on that, they change the specialization. And even if they are specialized in one species of livestock, they try to add another one so that they, have, they can distribute the risk and something like that. We, within all this process, their uh, care should be given to women and children because they increase women workload and also uh, increase dependence on low return marginal activities such as wood cutting, brick making, and uh, also some kind of charcoal making, all these activities is mainly taken by, by, by women so as to, to get more financial resources and uh, engaging women in different kinds of work labor, being labor in an urban center or working for other uh, people. I will finish by giving uh, in the next slide by, by talking a little bit about what is uh, identify pressure points and constraints. Variability of the Sahel, we know that it will continue and we should look for better understanding of the characteristics and processes and causes on different aspects of the climate issue, not only rainfall, but also temperature and other important factors. And uh, in different parts of the dry land, because of the overexploitation of the natural resources, we see that many resources are depleted and, deg and degraded so that all the uh, all, all these aspects should be taken into account and how it's affecting the productivity of the livelihood system. And also when talking about livelihood system, we should not think only about the production capacity, but more about adaptive food systems to enhance the food security and prevent future damage. Uh, also the flexibility and adaptability both of the important criteria for livelihood system dominated in dry land they are facing a lot of constraints, like, for example, commercial expansion of agriculture in different parts of dry land, and also shifting, uh, and also changing and, and, and shifting specialization is also another problem affecting the flexibility and adaptive capacity. In this context, I would like to end by saying long-term approach for building the resilience of this system is the most important uh, part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Hussein Suleiman. Now, moving on to Professor Zelena Naumova. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I will recap in two words the previous speakers, um, in a sense that the key points we made from really very important angle of um, seasonal variation and acute malnutrition and climate change in a dry land. What I will do in my presentation, and as it's shown in the next slide, I will have four objectives for this presentation. I will talk about notion of seasonality from the complex system perspective. I will cover challenges in quantifying seasonal, uh, seasonality, especially in times of rapid changes. Uh, in climate and environments. And I will also show a few examples of seasonality in epidemiology of uh, malnutrition, uh, of, uh, of, of infectious diseases, which are known to be linked to malnutrition overall. So in the next slide, um, I would like to point it out that seasonality is a manifestation of a complex system dynamics. In each field of research or practice dealing with environmental, biological, social systems, seasonality reflects the feature of a complex system. Um, it's, it's a complicated process which are heavily interlinked and very much interconnected. Um, it's represent a structure which are self-organizing, have a feedback loops, uh, contain a network of connection capable to change, evolve, and adapt. And dry land with a complexity in livelihood systems are no exceptions. So on the next slide, I would like to tell you that the knowledge about the phenomenon of seasonality and how it was linked um, to human health conditions are known for very long time ago. Since Hippocrates, people observe that the weather is seasonal and crops are ripen at the regular times, diseases are also regular in their appearances. 
But what is different now? Um, it's our understanding of seasonality drivers. And we start to recognize better and better that the proper quantification in specific uh, applications are still lacking and present us with the major challenges. As the next slide showing, uh, the seasonality is, uh, could be defined in many different ways, but in epidemiology, uh, especially in epidemiology of infectious diseases, seasonality is defined as a systematic or repetitive periodic fluctuations in the parameter of interest. It could be, for example, a disease incidence that occurs within the course of a year. Seasonality can be characterized by a set of uh, important characteristical values, peak timing, amplitude, duration. And these three parameters form a seasonal pattern or a seasonal curve. It means that the measure of health outcome could vary over the course of the year in a very specific way with alternating period of a high and low incidence. When seasonality is present, we need to know not only the annual mean, but also the time of seasonal peaks and their amplitude. Following the classic epidemiological concept of person, time, and space, the seasonal patterns could vary by subpopulation from year to year, from location to location, from pathogen to pathogen, in accord with the drivers that govern seasonal patterns. And variability in seasonal characteristics make seasonality quite elusive. That say, at the same time, this variability can provide important clues on factors that influence in disease occurrence, exposure, spread, manifestation. To show how these features may work, I will use a few examples from epidemiology of infections, which are known to be linked to malnutrition. So I would like to start with showing you a seasonal pattern of salmonella. In the next slide, you can see that the seasonal pattern of diseases fluctuate. There are a period of uh, very high incidence and there are a period of low incidence. Means that something happens in an environment which modified and change the variation in the disease. It means in a given population, we are capable of reaching the minimum, but we need to be aware of maximum and we can create an alarm system or early warning system when the incidents start to go up. We know that for infectious diseases um, like salmonellosis, the variability, the temporal variability can explain over 70% um, in these temporal seasonal variations. Seasonality of uh, foodborne and waterborne infections exhibit a very strong seasonal pattern, very distinct to specific pathogens in specific locations and localities. And they are common in all the climates. They are observed in developed countries and in low-income countries. We can see them from surveillance data, from hospitalization claims, death records in birth cohort studies, and it means that it is uh, a very important feature to consider and very carefully to very carefully uh, quantify. In the next slide, I want to show that if a seasonality is present, we really need to think about what and how those seasonal manifestations are related to each other. Um, they are linked to numerous factors. Um, those factors drive the seasonality of uh, waterborne infections. Seasonality of infections are shown to be linked to seasonality of caloric intake, food availability, feeding and hygiene practices. Infections produced and depends on innate and acquired short-term and long-term immunity, which in turn could be modified by seasonal emergence of new pathogens and pathogen ecology the increase or decrease in the concentration of pathogen and in the environment and the probability of exposure to pathogens are connected to water quality, water availability, water sources, 
uh, and how they are used. And this usage and these characteristics very much depend on climate conditions and meteorological events. Many of these patterns are absorbed in the livelihood system and modified by social calendar, cultural calendaric events, seasonal migration, seasonality of purchasing power, which in turn are linked to birth pattern and pregnancy complications, and the cycle continues. It means we need to very carefully consider this very complicated interplay that drives uh, uh, seasonality consistently and seasonality can change. It's important to recognize that individual effects uh, of individual factors could be very often masked by the synergy. Not only it is important to identify the dominant drivers, but also consider amplifications of some factors. Even in seemingly small and in important, they might be behaving as a amplifiers or they can do a dampening effect of different completing forces. For example, on the next slide, I want to show you that in developed country, uh, like in UK, we see a very strong seasonal fluctuation in a well-defined um, waterborne infections. And it's, again, depends very much on seasonal fluctuations and exhibit seasonal fluctuation of a very interesting characteristic forms with two peaks. One of the main feature of the complex system is a feedback loop, which in part controls stability of seasonality. So stable seasonality or seasonality with a small variation in peak timing, in intensity or duration is indeed indicative of uh, some level of synchronization and disease in incidence and controlled by the environmental or social processes. Even in the same location, in one location in UK, where there is no differences in terms of the uh, rain pattern between these specific two locations, we see a dramatic difference in seasonal pattern. One uh, is um, one uh, uh, incidence rate is present in the locations which are used primarily groundwater supplies shown in the solid line. But the dashed line with a much higher level of intensity and seasonality demonstrate a quite rapid change typical for places using a different water treatment system. In the next slide, I want to tell you that uh, in reality, we can actually examine this relationship in a way more complex and more complicated way and is exploring this uh, uh, continuous relationship. We also able to collect data now from remote system, systems, which actually um, amplify the signal that relationship between climate and diseases are far from simple and linear. They depends on many different factors. And even if you will take a rain, it depends on timing, its intensity and duration. The mist or torrential rain before harvest or during planting periods have a very different short-term, mid-term or long-term effect on the incidence of infections. This complexity might hold for many environmental variables, including ambient temperature. And we also um, understand that by defining very well one system, one can make an educated guess how it might affect another system based on the feature like, like lag or delay between the peak of diseases and the peak of exposure. So in this specific case, we actually identify that for different diseases and cryptosporidiosis is one of them, if we will link data in a specific order and compile them in a specific order using remote uh, system technology and data obtained from multiple sources. The next slide illustrates that compilation of these specific characteristics can give us very important value. Uh, we see that uh, there is a specific delay between the diseases and um, peaks in environmental parameters. It's almost a one month delay, which can give us time to react, to act and make proper precautions. So with climate change and increasing disturbances, we might expe expect clearly, and we see it already many examples for that, that seasonality 
is also reacting um, accordingly. So I would like to conclude this presentation with the following. In the next slide, um, I want to recap that um, the understanding of seasonality of malnutrition involves multiple factors. And from a um, complex system perspective and interdisciplinary revision and thinking, using new models, new data analytics, new visualization tools, and new information technology, we probably can borrow a lot of really very important tools to better understand the seasonality of malnutrition and drive our change and drive to our understanding of developing a, a strong early warning system and better understanding what can be done. So at this note, I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Professor Naumova. And now for our final panelist, Anastasia Marshak. Great, thank you, Severia, for that introduction. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so as we've heard from the other panelists, we'd see that seasonality is an essential feature in most environments, but it's particularly stark in drylands from both a perspective of high variability in terms of temperature, precipitation, and vegetation, but also relative unpredictability. For example, the start of a rains can differ by almost two months, depending on what year of data you're looking at in places like Chad, Sudan, and South Sudan. And so given this high seasonal variability, and as we've heard from the other panelists, drivers of acute malnutrition also take on a very seasonal dimension and are mediated through institutions and livelihoods. So here, we're not saying that changes in temperature, precipitation, or vegetation on their own are a driver of malnutrition, rather that these seasonal changes are a trigger of the underlying and immediate drivers. And so given the complexity of the seasonal patterns of the drivers of acute malnutrition, we would expect an equally complex and nuanced pattern in acute malnutrition itself. And therefore, we need the appropriate tools and models to analyze it as described by Elena in the previous panel. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about a specific study that hopefully exemplifies some of the points brought out earlier by the panelists that was recently wrapped up in Eastern Chad in partnership between Tufts University and Concern Worldwide. So first, a little bit about the context of Chad. So Eastern Chad, but also Chad really as a whole, experiences droughts about every two to three years, which is common of a drylands. But unfortunately, very frequently, these droughts end up translating into a humanitarian emergency. However, even in years where there isn't a humanitarian emergency, the prevalence of acute malnutrition still frequently exceeds or comes close to the emergency threshold of 15% prevalence. So we're seeing that this area is very much characteristic of what Helen described as an area experiencing persistent levels of acute malnutrition, even in the absence of a humanitarian emergency. So a little bit about the climate. So this part of Chad and a lot of the dry lands in the Sahel really has one main rainy season, but we really need to go beyond thinking about rainy versus dry or harvest versus post harvest and really look at the much more complexity that is found in terms of the climate variables. And one way to get at this is to look at remote sensing data. And another way to get at this is to get community perspectives on that seasonality. So this is where I'd like to direct your attention to the figure in this uh, in the slide. So communities in Chad, but also across the border in uh, Sudan, identified five main seasons. So I don't have time to get over all of them, but I'm just going to focus on a couple of the ones that are going to be most important for this presentation. The first season, as described so eloquently by Hussein, is Rushash. This is an extremely short season, about three weeks long, and it's that very beginning of a rains, that first few drops that come in the first three weeks. And then we transition into what we think of more traditionally as the rainy season. The other season I want to bring your attention to is the season of Darat. This is the harvest season that happens right at the end of the rains when seasonal rivers begin to dry out and more farming communities harvest. And the last season I want to bring your attention to is a season of Shita that happens right after the harvest season and into the cool dry season before we really transition into what we think of as the traditional hot dry season. 
So given this variability in how seasonality is described by the local communities, but also in terms of the climatic variability, we knew that if we wanted to understand uh, the drivers of acute malnutrition and the seasonal patterns of acute malnutrition, we would need to do longitudinal panel data. So what we did is we followed children six to 59 months in 89 households across eight villages for 23 months, collecting monthly data on anthropometry, as well as through interviews on hypothesized drivers of acute malnutrition. We also did in-depth qualitative work using focus groups and key informant interviews at key periods in the year. So what did we find? Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So we found an extremely interesting pattern in acute malnutrition. We actually found two peaks of acute malnutrition. One peak was at that really important season that Bo Hussein and I described, the season of Rushash, that short season when just the first rains come. What's particularly important next is that we're actually seeing a reduction in the prevalence of acute malnutrition throughout the rainy season itself. And then we see a secondary but much smaller peak at the end of a rains and before uh, the harvest season. This is the peak that we most traditionally associate with communities that do harvesting and farming. Um, next slide, please. So what's particularly interesting about this pattern is that we do not think it's just unique to Eastern Chad. Uh, research undertaken by Tufts and FAO in the past two years, looking at 20 years of nutrition data across Chad, Sudan, and South Sudan, so using smart nutrition surveys, identified almost the exactly same pattern across these three contexts. A major primary peak in Rushash, then a decrease in the prevalence of acute malnutrition during the rainy season, a small secondary peak um, at the right before the harvest season, and the best time of year, both in this secondary data analysis and in our primary data analysis in GAS beta, was that cool, dry season. That's when the prevalence of acute malnutrition falls almost to the SDG targets for 2025. Uh, next slide, please. So what could be responsible for these uh, peaks of acute malnutrition? Well, we collected a host of data from both the quantitative and qualitative work. And while I don't have time to go into all of the possible drivers, I do wanna bring your attention specifically to the drivers identified under the first rains, the season of Rushash. As you can see, this is a particularly vulnerable uh, period according to households from the key informant interviews, but also from our quantitative surveys. This is a time of period where women have an extremely high workload, which unfortunately translates into less frequent feeding practices, including breastfeeding and hygiene practices. It's also, according to the communities and the veterinary services, the highest burden of animal disease. But also, at the same time, it's the period of time when households reported most likely to be sharing the same few minimal water sources with animals and humans. So the next peak that I wanna bring your attention to is that secondary peak that we described right between the rainy and harvest season. So this one is associated with, again, the more traditional drivers of acute malnutrition, high levels of food insecurity and a high burden of malaria. And the last season that I wanna bring your attention to is the cool dry season. So remember I told you this is the time of year that both the secondary and primary data collection identified as having the lowest burden of acute malnutrition. And we can see that reflected in the very few drivers that were identified as problematic during this year. So again, to me, this is a very optimistic image that we can achieve these low levels of acute malnutrition in the dry lands. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means that all interventions and policies need to be understood with respect to how specialized livelihood strategies engage with environmental variability. So interventions must emphasize and address different drivers at different seasons. We all generally agree that in order to prevent acute malnutrition, we need to take a multi-sectoral approach. But what I think is absent from that discussion is the issue of temporality. It's the idea that we need to address different sectors or components of different sectors at different times of year. 
Now, this thinking is already common when it comes to food insecurity or programming around farming and climate smart activities. We know that we have to focus those activities only at certain times of year in order for them to be valuable for the communities. But we really need to apply that same temporal seasonal lens to other drivers. So in terms of water access, hygiene, zoonotic diseases, even gender practices. So we really need to apply an approach that thinks both multi-sectorally, but also multi-temporally. And how do we do that? Well, the starting point for that is really how we design our data collection and the models we apply, as so eloquently described by Elena in the previous panel. And that's the way that we can really capture and understand the seasonality of acute malnutrition and its drivers in drylands and more widely. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Anastasia. And uh, it was it was very great listening to um, your presentation. So let me wrap up what we had so far. The Honorable Mohamed Elmi has argued that at the root of the challenges associated with the drylands is the poor understanding of the particular livelihood systems um, in these regions. And that persistent acute malnutrition is a failure of development. He has called for some very clear and specific changes at operational and institutional level, who I hope will be picked up in the question session. The presentation by Professor Hussein Suleiman has shown a strong relationship between access to food and the degree to which variable livelihood systems succeed in matching the variability of potential inputs from the environment. Conversely, acute malnutrition can follow from processes that disrupt or interrupt such interface. Professor Elena Naumova has underlined the complexity of seasonality in dryland regions, driven by the spatial and temporal variability of precipitations, which in turn interact with other environmental variables. And she has discussed the challenges of modeling seasonality and the advantages of using a complex system dynamics framework. Finally, Anastasia Marshak has presented recent data from Chad, Sudan and South Sudan, showing not just the annual peak of acute malnutrition at the beginning of the cold dry season, which is normally predicted in the literature, but also a higher peak right at the beginning of the rainy season. Scholars of pastoralism won't have been surprised to hear that the beginning of the rains is the hardest time. As for myself, I was surprised to hear that this typically pastoral peak is visible in the historical data and yet largely absent in the analysis of acute malnutrition. Indeed, one of the implications Anastasia draws from this research is the need to reconsider the methodological framework of the analysis of malnutrition. This concludes the prepared topic we had for discussion. With the remaining time, I would like to open things up more generally to the audience. And I'm going to turn it over to Greg again, to manage the question and answer. I know he has been very busy collecting the questions that you have been sending through and through. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Severio. Um, thanks to the panelists. And before we go to the question and answer, I'd like to quickly mention some ways that you can get involved and learn more after the event is over. We have a website shown here dedicated to this technical series and follow-up work. On this website, you'll find short videos about the series, details about each event so you can register. If the event has already happened, you'll find the recordings. You can review the adapted framework and get more information about each of the three interlinked areas of basic drivers. You can find resources and you can do a number of things to get involved. Join the email list, submit questions for panelists. This is for past or upcoming panels. So if a burning question comes to you after the event, please send it to us. You can also submit feedback or tell us about your experiences addressing basic causes of malnutrition. And finally, you can tell us what you think of these events. We hope you will engage with us through this platform. Now on to the questions. Please continue to add your questions as you have them. We will get to as many as we can, but I can't make any promises since we have over 150 people on the event. So let me start with a question that came in for Anna. Uh, Anna, could the two peaks 
of acute malnutrition be capturing different livelihood specializations, pastoralists versus farmers? Uh, thank you for that question, Greg. So we actually do have a mix of communities in our sample that lies kind of on the spectrum of that livelihood specialization in terms of about half of the communities have a history in livestock livelihood specialization and half of the communities have more of a history of farming, though they all do some farming and some livestock ownership. And what we do see is a different in prevalence of acute malnutrition between these two communities, but we do not see a different in the seasonality. Both communities have these two peaks, the peaks before the rains, uh, right at the start of the rains, and that peak right before the harvest. And there's actually a paper that came out in 2010 specifically comparing uh, mobile pastoralist communities in Western Chad versus sedentary, more farming communities in Western Chad during these two times of year and found that for both communities, the peak was highest at the start of the rains. So we do think that while it's important to consider livelihood specialization, the presence of those two peaks exists irrespective of livelihood specialization. Thank you, Greg. Great. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, let me go to a question for Elena, if I can. Um, um, let me get my question here, Elena, sorry. Um, Elena, how seasonality, the question is around how seasonality of disease and food security impacts on growth and morbidity in children under two years? Uh, thank you very much. I think it's extremely important questions. And I believe that maybe in different climates and in different conditions, we might see a slight variation of how that impact is visible. Uh, but it's clearly that it have, might have a short-term effect. So the change in mortality and the change in morbidity would be very noticeable in a period of time where the food insecurity is lacking. And it could be lacking for multiple reasons. One of them would be a seasonal component where the environment is extremely, or livelihood system is extremely sensitive to the climate change. Or it might be due to um, non-seasonal events, um, like for example, artificial disruption um, or intended disruptions in the food supplies, which are related to conflict and um, different uh, emergency situation. But even the long effect of mortality, of mor morbidity, infections, and uh, uh, infectious diseases is extremely important to consider. Uh, the, maybe that effect is not immediately visible with respect to malnutrition and growth um, uh, changes, but it may be a fact uh, that impact will be way more notable. Uh, in, in maybe in a year or two uh, year span, but even it can touch uh, very importantly long-term consequences. And, and that long-term consequences are quite prominent, not only in the domain of health, but it's also cognitive functions, development, and uh, general participations later on in active life. Great, thank you, Elena. Um, I've got a question um, for Dr. Suleiman. Um, let me read that out to you, Dr. Suleiman. Uh, your presentation has demonstrated how flexibility and mobility have been key for pastoralist resilience and access to food and drylands. How would this resilience and food security be impacted by the fact that in some countries, governments are encouraging sedentarization and resettlement in pastoralist zones. Dr. Suleiman, I think you're still muted. There you go. Sorry, thank you, Greg. Can you hear me now? We have you. Uh, yes, I can hear you fine. You can put your video on if you like. Uh, maybe the host is the Ted, if I stop, not by me. Okay. I can't turn it on. Well, go ahead. We can hear you fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for the question. Uh, 
Uh, I think this is a very important question. And this practice, uh, I think, happening in different countries, including Sudan. And from time to time, we hear about settling down pastoralists in, in, in such an environment. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, in the eastern part of Sudan, they try to introduce, to introduce this policy in the 80s and again in the 90s and trying to develop some kind of settlement for them. Uh, but anyhow, pastoralists are not accepting that, but they're still moving around. And the big question is that how can we fulfill the requirement of animals in such very variable envir environment with very uh, limited resources, especially for water, and to bring them in one place? And I think this is one of the issues that is causing degradation if we concentrate animals in one place. I remember in my slides, I showed that for some reason, they try to keep animals around their settlements during a difficult time when there is no enough resources. And because of that, there is degradation around villages. So that one of the issues to solve this problem is to allow animals to move around in that kind of flexible, flexible kind of adaptive kind of, of, of mobility. This, I think, still will continue to be the best practice. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Hossein. Um, Honorable Elmi, uh, Muhammad, I, I've got a question for you. Um, the question is, it would be interesting to hear of any good experiences or research around the issue of keeping children with animals. Actually, unfortunately, mine is not from research. Practically, for a number of years, I worked in the with Oxfam in Nigeria, and uh, we did a number of things. One was uh, the battered animals that they used to go and get water. And uh, the dry it gets, the farther the livestock goes. And therefore, what the pastoralists would normally do when it gets hard like that, like 20, 30 kilometers, they bring the children to the to the settlements, and they quite easily get acute malnutrition very fast. So what we did was uh, to bring the water closer so that they come for, let's say, the household water at uh, like five kilometers. And we did that for two different droughts and it helped. And then mm -hmm. in a later year, I think to, when we had the big drought in um, 2009 or so, we looked around and looked at the big rangelands where there's plenty of fodder, but no water. And we came up with a variety of approaches. One was to sink a borehole, for, which was going to be closed down uh, after the, the rain, once the rains came, or we tracked water there. And therefore, we were able to keep the animals and the children, all of them remaining those, and saved quite a lot of lives, uh, livestock, which was then their livelihood. I think the other bit, which is uh, important, somebody else had asked in, I looked at the question in the chat, is that water, if you develop water, they create a lot of settlements. And as some, another speaker said, a lot of degradation happens. At the moment, one of the, one of the reasons why we think policy makers should not understand it is one, they think the, the, the area is very empty, the low population, and they think, yeah, you can settle anywhere, and therefore slowly reducing the flexibility of parcels in the rangeland. And uh, therefore, it is very important that water is developed with a very clear uh, planning with the pastoralists themselves or together with agro pastoralists. And uh, you don't put water everywhere and because it degrades the rangeland. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question uh, actually for you, Hussein. Um, it's pretty technical. So uh, how do you track livestock movement with remote sensing data? data or do you use GPS trackers? And I will, this part, uh, this, this slide I show in my presentation, they are part of a study with Tufts University Feinstein International Center. We are using uh, tracking devices, GBS tracking devices fixed on animals so that we have the ability to collect the data every 20 minutes for the whole uh, animal movement cycle. And after that, we're adding something like NDVI as background to give us better understanding about the biomass and how people, how livestock are, are tracking biomass. And also we have another dimension on adding some layers from satellite rainfall estimate to show the, the, the rainfall in the area at the same. 
Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question for either Anna or Elena, uh, perhaps both of you. It will be great to learn about the impact of both human and livestock diseases uh, on the dry land and as drivers of acute malnutrition, especially diseases that don't follow seasonality, for example, COVID-19 among humans. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah, it is clear. Uh, may I start, in and then I will, uh, you will continue uh, to cover it. I, I really appreciate that questions. And I mentioned at the end of my presentation that we, on the one hand, should study and better understand stable seasonal patterns. But I also mentioned that those stable seasonal patterns can be easily disturbed by um, extreme events. You know, it could be extreme events with respect to environment, but also with ex uh, extreme events with respect to uh, emerging pathogens. And COVID-19 is a clear example how that emerging pathogens can start to destroy the existing cycles. So those disturbances exist, they are much harder to study, but there are really very important tools and techniques which we need to consider. And without consideration of those disturbances, it's really very hard to, uh, to basically build predictions and um, understand what is uh, the range of predictability and range of variability in these systems. Um, so that type of connections are extremely important. There are ways of accounting for them, um, but we definitely need to collect data in the proper scheme and the proper, um, uh, with the proper frequencies and with the proper uh, appreciations of the uh, complexity of those systems as well. So Anna is, uh, I'm giving mic to you. Great, thank you, Elena. Um, so in terms of the role of human, of particularly zoonotic diseases, so diseases from animals that can be passed down to humans. We know that something like Cryptosporidium parvum, which Elaine actually presented on, is present in the Chad context and specifically comes from cattle and associated with environmental enteropathy in children. So that means the, the villa and the intestine are no longer able to absorb nutrients in the same way. And so I think what's important in the drylands is because livestock ownership is such a critical component of livelihoods, it's then important to understand the seasonality of animal disease and almost overlaid with the seasonality of livestock mobility and where those things overlap. One of the things that could be driving that major peak that we saw right at the start of a rains is that that is a period of overlap of both livestock disease and the presence of livestock and humans in uh, in closer proximity. And so it means we also have to understand what are the drivers of that mobility, but also what are the, the pressures and constraints related to that mobility that might increase the presence of this disease of transmission of zoonotic disease from animals to humans. And so I think that understanding is absolutely critical in order to really be able to track, predict, and understand the role of zoonosis, but also how we can best uh, address it while still supporting the preferred livelihood specialization of these communities. Thank you, Greg. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, let me add, I wanna come back to you Anna, again, but also Hussein, uh, there's a question around the seasonality of conflict has not been mentioned. Could Anna and Hussein, and perhaps also Mohammed, you may wanna comment on this as well, tell us more if they can. Hussein, perhaps you want to jump in on that. Hussein, do you want to start? And then I can jump in? Hussein, your video is off and you're on mute, just to let you know. Yep. Hussein, go ahead. Unmute mute yourself and go ahead. Anna, do you want to start while Hussein's getting unmuted? Yep, uh, I'll happily start. So from a 
much more data technical side, we do know that conflict is extremely seasonal as part of our analysis of trying to understand those twin peaks of acute malnutrition in Chad, Sudan, and South Sudan. Something that we did, and this was done by our colleague Ash Venkat at the Friedman School, is to look at the ACLED data, which is the data on conflict events, and try to use some of the similar modeling techniques to Develop, uh, develop, described by Elena in order to understand the seasonality of conflict. And what we actually found is that there is extremely high seasonality of conflict and there are two peaks present. One is present at the, around the harvest period, again, when animals and, uh, and farmers are most likely to interact. And then again, it's present at the beginning of the rains, again, when animals and farmers are more likely to interact as animals return to the watering points and as farmers are starting to plant. So definitely it is extremely seasonal, um, but likely also changes from year to year and also probably exacerbated or sometimes mitigated by different policies, particularly traditional policies where both livestock owners and farmers could take better advantage of their interactions. Okay, over to you, Hussein. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you, Anna. I think uh, Anna answered most of the question. I would like just to add one more, more, more aspect, uh, especially when we are, there is delay, delay in rainfall and people are, they have from local perception, this year might be a dry year and there is delay in rainfall precipitation. People are competing on remaining resources like forest areas, something like that, and more an area near from water sources, so that also in such years, uh, when there is a delay in rainfall, we expect more, 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 uh, more uh, conflict events. Another issue is the issue of institutions. I think institutions play a very important role in this aspect. Uh, seasonality is an important factor, but I think institution, how they are performing in a specific area also could, feel, uh, could, could be considered in, in this aspect. Uh, yeah. Mohammed, did you like to add something? Mohammed, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think what um, the two speakers have uh, pointed about the seasonality part. The part I wanted to add is two aspects. One, it is possible to, within the early warning system, to put in also a monitoring system for conflicts, and then also have an institution that is uh, an assigned specialism. Like in Kenya, we have the National Steering Committee that looks at and makes sure that they stop it. Um, in recent times, sometimes, uh, all sorts of things uh, trigger the conflicts because of small arms, because of uh, a whole variety of things, including, uh, you know, weak uh, um, a judicial system in terms of adjudicating. And therefore, it is important that uh, conflict definitely makes any season of variety, especially drought, worse. And therefore, monitoring it, stopping it as early as possible is very important. Great. Thank you all for that. Um, I actually have a question in here for Helen. Uh, Helen, I know you're there. So let me read out this question for you. The 1990 UNICEF framework starts with potential resources. Is this what environment and seasonality is replacing? In the discussion of the framework, they say technological, ecological conditions include ecological constraints, existing tools, available natural resources, and technology as well as knowledge, skills, and practices. This determines what is produced. How is the new framework better? A nice, easy question. <laughs> um, I, I, I should be clear, our um, development of the basic drivers is specific for Africa's drylands where we see persistent acute malnutrition. It's not intended as a replacement or substitute for the original UNICEF framework, rather we are building on that. If we go back to that original framework and we look at the narrative around it, we can see many similarities with um, what we are proposing to explore under these new basic drivers. And um, if you can stick with us and participate in some of the future webinars, I'll be able to explain more, more fully some of those similarities and where we go more deeply into some of the issues that were touched on in the original framework, but not really subsequently developed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Helen. 
Um, here is a question that I think could go to several of our panelists. It's, uh, let me read it out for you. We've got a few minutes left here. The issue of women's workload, which is affected by seasonality among other factors, has been shown to have a direct negative impact on childcare and by extension, health and nutrition. This means the timing of critical intervention should be prioritized. Did the research delve into behavior aspects at the household level and in gender perspectives and community participation in finding solutions, including supporting women and mothers in the communities? Um, Anna, perhaps if that was part of your research or I'm wondering. Yeah, I can I can talk about it. No, Thank we you. certainly found that that women's workload was absolutely critical, and it's particularly high during that period of Rushash when they're preparing the land, but also during the rainy season itself as they're actually doing the planting. And in terms of the preparation and the planting, that is unfortunately primarily women's workload, uh, women's responsibility. So while we do, while I do not have good suggestions of what we found in terms of mitigating that, one of the things that I think is particularly interesting and combines some of the stuff that Hussein was speaking about, making sure that we're bringing the resources, the like water resources to the rangelands themselves where people are going to be with the children and the livestock, we found something very similar in terms of even in farming communities. A lot of the women ended up having to be in temporary settlements in order that they could stay close to their farming land uh, during the period of Rushash and Karit. So they actually weren't in the community where all the interventions were brought. So that's where the boreholes were constructed, the latrines, the soap provided, et cetera. But the women weren't there. They were in these temporary settlements, working on the land, protecting it from livestock with some of their youngest children under the age of two with them. So we really have to think about it's not just women's workload, but where are they physically present to make sure that when we're bringing in interventions, especially during these particularly critical times of year, that we're actually bringing the interventions to where the women are and where the children, particularly under the age of two are. And I think that consideration isn't always made because we think of communities as rather sedentary, where even farming communities actually have a lot of migration, even if it is just the five kilometers to get to this temporary settlement. Thank you, Greg. Okay, thank you, Anastasia. Um, this one, it's a, quite a short uh, question, but I think uh, Hussein and Muhammad, both maybe for you, how is land degradation affecting nomadic livelihoods? Either one of you gentlemen, jump in. Hussein, thank you. When you ask uh, any nomadic guys about his practice, the first answer he said to me, I don't think uh, we will continue the same kind of uh, mobility in the future because there is, uh, they are observing the issue of degradation all over the place. And they are think that one of the factors that are pushing the coming generation maybe to settle down is the availability of resources because of the degradation. Uh, degradation is not only from the environmental uh, aspects, including the expansion of uh, agriculture in different, in different places, and also the unplanned distribution of water resources and overutilization of resources around water sources. All these issues are degradation, but in remote and wide areas where there is no water resources, the environment is still healthy and somehow uh, uh, during rainy season, they can go to, to, to such places, but in highly populated area, degradation is well noticed, so that unexpected will affect the kind of, of, of mobility and to make them more settled uh, settlement. Good, thank you. Mohammed. I'm going to let you have the last word. Go ahead. Uh, I think he, Hussein said it right. I want just to add that uh, in recent times, in the conservancies in Northern Regular Trust, Communities have started uh, doing rangeland planning, where they set aside a, an area so that it rejuvenates. It used to be there during the colonial; we lost it, 
but as you said, it still remains a major challenge where people, because they think they are doing good, put up water, uh, put up schools in settlements, which are like four kilometers from each other. And therefore even goats cannot graze between the two. And therefore that's some of the areas that, you know, really needs a policy push, a policy push to ensure that uh, um, before we lose all the rangeland, um, some uh, a stop or a moratorium is put in place until there's a, a proper plan. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, we've got just a few minutes left, so we have many more questions than we can possibly get to. Uh, but I'm going to have to stop here to, uh, to make sure we end on time. Uh, please keep an eye on your email, and we will share the recording next uh, in the next couple of days. And we will follow up after the high-level donor roundtable to share the outcome of that meeting. Now I'm going to ask Severio to give us some final thoughts. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to all of you for such a helpful collection of challenging and inspiring questions. And thanks in advance also to those who will follow up offline. So this panel is coming to an end. It has focus on the natural environment and seasonality because of the strong functional relationship with people's livelihood in the drylands. Therefore, acute malnutrition in the drylands can be adequately analyzed only on the basis of, of a sound understanding of such a functional relationship. And of course, of what gets in its way. It is perhaps worth emphasizing that the natural environment that matter in relation to people's livelihoods and malnutrition are not the natural, are not the neutral and detached ecosystems of geography and natural sciences. With regard to the natural environment in seasonality, what matters for the analysis of malnutrition is always and ultimately the ways these are experienced by the people who use them for their livelihoods. And people's experience of the environment is almost always mediated by other people, either directly or in the form of social or institutional interfaces. This holds true also for climate change, although at the local level it might manifest itself through apparently natural phenomena. However, in the Anthropocene, these apparently natural phenomena happen because somewhere else, and over a long enough period of time, a particular set of social and institutional interfaces have resulted, so to speak, in turning up the heating at the scale of the planet. The natural phenomena that we are inclined to see as fundamental causes impacting on people's livelihoods are actually only the last trigger of a selective crisis resulting from the ways particular configurations of social and institutional interfaces construct people's particular experience of the natural environment. People's most fundamental environment is inescapably social and institutional and this is going to be the focus of the next webinar in this series, to which, of course, you are all warmly invited. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much and goodbye.